We left off in episode 3, discussing the Numa Python, or Python Spirit, the demons responsible for influencing people in the occult, divination, soothsaying, and this new age movement. These spirits are what the Bible calls familiar spirits, which God forbids us from trafficking with. Over the past 15 years, we have witnessed a rise in the occult, and the use of the term karma has become part of the common vernacular, even amongst many who call themselves Christians. Karma is a major belief in Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, and Taoism religion, whose core belief is reincarnation or the cycle of rebirths, samsara. It is the concept that all life forms go through a cycle of reincarnation and that karma affects the nature and quality of one's life and future lives. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary gives this definition of karma, the force generated by a person's actions held in Hinduism and Buddhism to perpetuate transmigration and in its ethical consequences to determine the nature of the person's next existence. They believe each individual is born with karma, which is a residual for past lives that must be resolved. The god of karma and the belief of samsara is a practice and worship of the demon god Baram. So the next time you use the term karma, know that you are speaking on behalf of python demons to the demon god Brahma. Let's proceed. The next demon we will speak of is Paneros, Numus, or Evil Spirits. Acts, chapter 19, verses 14 through 16. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. Eventually, one of the Paneros, Numa, or Evil Spirits, answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. The attack was so violent that they ran out of the house naked and wounded. This passage clearly shows us these creatures are beings who are aware, think, plan, communicate, and know our spiritual state. They knew the seven sons of Sceva and the Jewish priests and knew they were really not followers of Jesus Christ and had no spiritual authority to cast them out. They basically told them, you use his name, but you do not belong to Jesus and have no authority to cast us out in his name. And then they proceeded to whoop on the men so violently that they sent them out bleeding and naked. Paneros means hurtful in effect and influence, which causes degeneration from the original virtue, physically and morally. What that means is these demons are especially culpable of causing both the moral and physical decay of a person. These demonic forces are especially vicious and responsible for the wickedness, mischief, malice, lewdness, grievous harm, annoyances, perils, and hardships we see in everyday life. Paul speaks of these Paneros demons in Ephesians 6.12 when he says spiritual wickedness in high places or nematicus, which means spiritual forces, paneria, which is plural for paneros, in high places. These paneros demons are the ones responsible for spiritual attacks. Ephesians 6, 13 through 16. Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of the evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with a breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now the term evil or evil one, or if you're reading a King James Version, it says wicked, is, you guessed it, Paneros. These demonic forces are especially vicious and responsible for causing wickedness, mischief, malice, lewdness, grievous harm, annoyances, perils, and hardships we see in everyday life. These spiritual attacks seek to cause in us anger, 
spite, bitterness, prejudice, unforgiveness, hatred, violence, lewdness, hurtfulness, vengeance, and a host of other hostile thoughts, emotions, and feelings. These are the fiery darts they shoot at us. Jesus refers to these paneros, demons, in Matthew twelve forty-five, when he says, Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked, or paneros, than himself. And they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. So the next time you turn on the news and you hear about the evils and wickedness that man does, no, paneros numas are involved. Next is the numa planos, which are seducing spirits, spirits of error. First Timothy four one. Now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to numa planos or seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We encounter these demons daily, and their sole purpose is to deceive, lead astray, manipulate, seduce, and allure us into falsehood and lies. They are the conmen of the spiritual realm the architects and builders of strongholds in our lives. They lure people from a position of stability into instability to capture them in a web of lies. Much of their deception, seduction, and allure come from a kernel of truth. You are sad, they tell you, aren't you? He whispers. You really never got over the thing your brother did to you. It's really affecting your personality. Why not do something about it? Why not get even with him? Hmm. It is true that your brother did something hurtful to you. It is true that you are sad. But the rest is an exaggeration and accusations. Soon a supposed truth is ringing in your head and you lose sight of the real truth. An insinuation turns into a motivation to retaliate. You may have begun the day as a faithful follower only to end it with an unforgiving, bitter, vindictive spirit. These seducing spirits love to seduce people into stubbornness, anger, jealousy, and unforgiveness that lends way to spite and bitterness, and many become defiled, causing in many a stubborn refusal to forgive others who have hurt or disappointed them, not to let go of the past, causing many to forget the basic principles of grace. We all have our own scenarios that play out in our daily lives of thoughts that are distorted or warped versions of the truth that try to lead us, bring us to, permitting a lie to gain traction in our minds. This is the business of seducing spirits. When people are being seduced, they are not thinking, not even when they think they are. Look at the master of seducing and deceiving spirits whom Jesus calls the father of lies. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yeah, has God said, or did God really say, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Here is where he begins his manipulation of the truth. He knew God said of every tree you may eat of, but you must not eat of the one particular tree, and that was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. The woman being beguiled and seduced by a manipulation of the truth added her own interpretation of what God told them. Verse 2, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now God never told them that they must not touch the tree. He simply said, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So Eve added an interpretation to what God had told them. Now, some of you may think the serpent didn't manipulate Eve to say the wrong thing. She did so on her own. Yet the same people will and do believe the psychology of persuasion used in today's techniques by advertisers and marketers, which strongly influence the thoughts of others. These are the same techniques employed by Lucifer which is the psychology of mixing facts with opinions to get the person to respond the way you want. The main task of a manipulator is to put them in an illusory environment or state 
so they won't notice the manipulation, but only perceive the set of circumstances. The serpent then goes on with his deception, manipulation, and seduction. Verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. See, a lie by omission is still a lie. A lie which is part truth is still a lie. She would not drop dead that very instant, but in disobeying God, death would come into the world. And Lucifer knew that. He lied to her by manipulation and omission. He then uses the opportunity to draw her attention away from God unto her own lust and desires. Verse 5. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The devil used half-truths to give Eve the impression he knew some secret information that she should desire to know. I know the truth, he was saying to her. God has misled you. He's holding back facts. You should know. Boom. Trap sprung. Verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Seducing spirits always work according to three principles. The principle of the world, the principle of the flesh, the principle of the devil. The principle of the world does not only mean the things within the world, but also means the ideas, reasoning, and philosophies contained within the world. The reasoning and logic of man, apart from the spirit of God, is the logic of the world. Using the world's logic and reasoning rather than God's, you begin doing what seems right in your own eyes. Actually, you're being manipulated by the enemy, the prince of the power of the air, to get you to lean to your own understanding, your own judgment, instead of judging matters by the word of God or what God tells us. These seducing spirits, spirits of error, know that cares of the world, pride of life, Love for this world is enmity against God. They want to manipulate us to think our way, believe our way, do it our way, because essentially that is their way, enmity and rebellion against God. The flesh. Usually when we think about seduction of the flesh, we think lust of the body, carnality, people who are addicted to alcohol, drugs and pornography, stuff like that. Though these things are correctly labeled lust of the flesh, the principle of the flesh does not only mean sexual desire or other lust contained in the flesh, it can also mean the emotions of the flesh. Many people base their relationship with God and with others on how they feel. They pray on the basis of whether they feel in distress or not. They pick up their Bibles only when the world around them sees them crashing down. And then being ignorant of the word of God, they complain because the Lord does not provide an immediate solution to their problem. Then they have demonic inspired anger against God. People allow devilish seduction of their emotions, just like spoiled little kids, and say and believe in themselves. God doesn't love me because he did not give me. They are led by seducing spirits who have told them love is based on how you feel instead of who you are committed to. It is a good thing the Lord Jesus does not base his love for us on how he might feel about us. We ignore him, break his commandments, violate his precepts, discard his word, fail to reflect his love to others or even to him. It is a good thing his love is commended love and not the kind of love these creatures would have us to think is real love. Principle 3. The Devil Jesus calls Satan the father of lies. He leads man astray and the whole world is under his influence. It tells us in 1 John 5.19 and Revelation 12.9. Any and all violations of God's precepts and laws, be it a trespass, a transgression, an iniquity, sin or abomination, no matter how big or small, it originates from the evil one's mandate to seducing spirits to influence man to defy his creator, whether knowingly or unknowingly. All sin is based upon some lie, manipulation, or seduction, and behind each lie, manipulation, or seduction are the emissaries of Satan, who is a father of lies. James 1.14 tells us, Every man sins when he is enticed and drawn away by his own lust, and sin is conceived. 
To be enticed tells us there is an enticer or a seducer. The word entice, de la adzo, means a lure or baited hook. These creatures are anglers, baiting us to draw us away from the safety of self-restraint to sin. That's their business, their job, on behalf of their master, the father of lies. We could go on and on about Numa Planos, or seducing, deceiving spirits. There is just too much to cover. So we're going to move on to Numa Austenia, or spirits of affirmity. Luke, chapter 13, verse 11. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity, or Numa Austenia, eighteen years, and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. Now this passage shows us that infirmities are and can be spirits. Now don't get me wrong, not all infirmities are demonic spirits, but we do know from scripture there are spirits which cause infirmity. In several scriptures down, Luke chapter 13 verse 16, Jesus says, And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, lo, these eighteen years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? Jesus clearly says that her infirmity was a binding inflicted upon her by the devil or demon emissaries of Satan. This woman's condition was not a possession, but a spiritual binding causing her infirmities. The name or designation Austenia means weakness, sickness, that refers to an ailment that deprives someone of enjoying or accomplishing what they would like to. Asthenia focuses on the handicaps that go with the weakness or illness. It is the weakening influence of the illness that causes someone to become wrongly dependent upon what is their weakness. So what we see is that Asthenia spirits not only bind people with physical ailments, but also dependencies, addictions such as alcohol drugs, lust, and various other addictions. For years, we have heard people call drug, alcohol, and other addictions a monkey on your back, which is not at all far from the truth. Look at this photograph that I uploaded. This photograph is of a Colorado man who reports to have kicked his drug habit after seeing this photograph of himself with a demon on his shoulder. Joe Martinez told Fox 31 News in Denver, that drugs were killing his soul, but he's now on the road to recovery because of the photograph, and I carry it wherever I go, he told the television station. Martinez's wife, Patty, said right away when she seen the photo, you really are walking with Satan. They gave the photograph to a photographic expert, John Davenport, and he told the news station the picture did not have evidence of tampering. It doesn't look like it was double printed or spliced in any way. The grain is uniform. These austenia spirits are the ones behind people's addictions, physical and mental ailments. So next time you see that person with a drug or alcohol addiction, realize and pray for them that they are released from that austenia demon or demons. And for that matter, pray for yourselves about your addictions. In Jesus' name, amen. Next is Numa Alelos or deaf and dumb spirit. Mark chapter 9 verse 17. And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which has a dumb or alilos spirit. You may think the scripture is only associating physical defect of being deaf and unable to speak with demons. However, if this be the case, then what do you do with these other passages? Mark 9.25 Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. Matthew 9.32 As they were leaving, a demon-possessed man who was mute was brought to Jesus. Matthew 12.22 Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. Luke 11.14 And he was casting out a devil, and it was dumb. And it came to pass, when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake. Scripture clearly shows us that Jesus spoke to and called the spirits by name, Numa Alelos, deaf or dumb spirits. 
He cast them out of people, and when they were gone, the deaf and dumb spoke. First of all, dumb has nothing to do with intelligence, as we can see from Scripture. These demons cause an inability to hear and speak. They are also responsible for causing in people stupors, personality disorders, neurosis, paranoia, suicidal tendencies, etc. You may wonder where I got this from. Well, in the story of the boy in Mark 9, we see in verse 18, these deaf and dumb spirits cause the boy to not only be deaf and unable to speak, but cause him to have fits of lunacy and self-mutilation. Verse 22, and oftentimes it has cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. We have all heard of such and such snapped. They had a mental breakdown, temporary insanity, and all other jargon of someone who just may have been possessed or overly oppressed by a deaf and dumb spirit. These all lost spirits' target is the mind to dull a person's mental and emotional state, causing warped thinking, spiritual dullness and slumber, confusion, inability to focus, think clearly, bringing about spiritual deafness, causing in one not to be able to hear or receive the things of God. These alalos deaf and dumb spirits are the ones responsible for blinding the minds of non-believers and causing spiritual slothfulness in believers, as well as all the other things we just mentioned. These deaf and dumb spirits are not just your common variety demons, but do exercise more influence over our society than we may imagine. Next is Numa Akartathus, or unclean spirits. Acts chapter 5 verse 16, there came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and them which were vexed with unclean or acarthatha spirits, and they were healed every one. Notice this passage does not say possess, but vexed or tormented by unclean or acarthatha spirits. These are what we would call imps. They move like a mob-like force, seeking to wreak havoc, exerting an overwhelming sense of vexation, annoyance, irritation, aggravation, displeasure, hoping to sweep us into the traps of their superior demon forces. But make no mistake, they are manipulative and take pleasure in pestering us in any way they can. They are the flies of the Lord of the Flies. Now, I know there are a number of demons that we have not covered in this study that you may be aware of or know of. However, as I mentioned several times throughout this series, we are only dealing with what is supported by biblical scripture. If you know of others, please feel free to email me at behad at fellowshipintheword.org with scripture references. May God keep you and bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for tuning in to Fellowship in the Word. If you've been blessed by this video, please click the subscribe button and the bell to receive notification of when we upload new videos. Thank you and God bless you.